Well, good morning, church family. How are we doing today? Amen. All right. I love we got clap energy over on this side. All right. I might preach a little harder over here this morning. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. It's good to be back with you guys. You know, last week, uh, Pastor Spencer did an incredible job. Katie and I were out of town, and uh, he did a great job teaching, uh, really, especially from Nehemiah chapter 6, about how when we are given to God's work, God's purposes for our lives in this world, that we will face opposition. And uh, I thought he did a wonderful job. Today, we're going to do a 30,000 foot flyover of the entire book of Nehemiah. So we'll probably be here two hours, three hours, something like that. And ha ha ha. And uh, <laughs> yeah, you got jokes. Me too. All right. Um, and, and really, from the book of Nehemiah, there are very many takeaways. There are many lessons, very many principles to, to glean from the book of Nehemiah. And we're going to touch on some of those throughout the message today. And then I really want to step back to the 30,000 foot view and go, okay, what is the main thrust of this book? And if you're new here, if you're a visitor here, we're thrilled to have you with us. We hope you enjoy your time with us. And for all of our regular church family, you know what I'm about to say, what I've been saying almost every week this year. And that is, we this year are doing what we're calling the year of the Bible, where we're taking January through December, going Genesis to Revelation, following the main thread, the main narrative, of the one story that is scripture, not random little isolated stories, recognizing the Bible is one story that leads us to Jesus. It continues to reveal and expound on and teach and show Jesus. Um, And so we are, we're doing that and we have a reading plan. If you want to jump in that reading plan with us, you can jump in right now by grabbing it out at the info desk once service is over and we will be in week 30 this next week. Um, and then, uh, yeah, we, we would love to have you jump in with us. All of that to say, this last week we were still reading in Nehemiah, and so I'm going to step back to 30,000 feet to kind of give a full, uh, full look at that book. Not even trying to rhyme, it's just happening today. All right, one of the things we want to check in to first is Nehemiah chapter 1. Go ahead and open your Bibles there if you've got one. Anytime you're here on a Sunday, if you need a Bible to read, we've got some on the shelves in the back over there if you want to grab one. Also, of course, there's apps you can use, and we'll have it on the screen. But I believe we need to look at Scripture with our own eyes. Nehemiah is a Jew who was born and raised um, and lived his entire life up until this point in the Persian Empire. He served as a cupbearer to King Artaxerxes. Remember, We have been in this era where Judah and Israel were two divided kingdoms. Judah, the southern kingdom. Israel was exiled to Assyria. Judah was exiled to Babylon. And then we learn about how Persia, the Medo-Persian Empire, conquered Babylon while Judah was still captive there. And so everyone who was serving Babylon then is serving Persia. And the king Cyrus, who conquered Babylon was moved by the Lord, even as a pagan, even as a non-follower of the, the Hebrew God, was moved by the Hebrew God to start sending people back to Judea. This fulfilled prophecies that Jeremiah and others had spoken of, Isaiah had spoken of. And so there were waves of people that moved back to Jerusalem. Altogether, it was about 50,000 people. And at this point in the story where Nehemiah's book enters the scene, is where Nehemiah is still there. He's amongst the people who are still in Persia, still living there, serving the king. And Nehemiah is a cupbearer, which means he was one of the closest people to the king there was. You would have the wife, you would have a couple of counselors, and you would have the cupbearer. There's a couple of things in the ancient Persian empire that were necessary or mandatory prerequisites, if you will, to serve in the court of the king, especially as cupbearer. One, you had to be good looking. So Nehemiah was handsome. Scripture doesn't teach that. Ancient Persian customs show us that, that you had to be good looking to serve in the court of the king. You had to be good looking. You had to be politically adept, able to 
engage in conversation relative to kingdoms and domains and politics, and you had to be sharp and capable of contributing to all the things that the king would want to talk about. If you didn't have those things going for you, or if you were missing one of those things, you could not serve in the king's court. So we know those things to be true of Nehemiah. So he grows up in Persia. He's serving the king's court very close to the king as his cupbearer, which also means anytime there was a meal prepared for the king, Nehemiah tasted it first, drank the wine first to make sure it wasn't poisoned. And if Nehemiah falls over dead, well, they find a new cupbearer and the king stays alive. That's the way it worked. They would protect the king that way. And so all of that We keep in mind as we read in Nehemiah chapter 1 is where we're going to start today in verse 1. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, now it happened in the month of Chislev in the 20th year as I was in Susa, the citadel, meaning he's still in Persia. Nehemiah is in Persia. That Han and I, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judah. They came to Persia to see uh, to see Nehemiah. And I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the exile, and uh, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates are destroyed by fire. So Nehemiah says, guys, how's it going back home? They say, not good. Things aren't good. The walls and the gates are still destroyed. Verse 4, as soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. He was grieved and heartbroken by this truth. Even though he's grown up in Persia, he still is very aware that he's a Hebrew and that his home is back there. So when he hears this news, he's broken by it. He's burdened by it. He sat down and wept and mourned for days. And check this out. And I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. I love this. Nehemiah's first response to this news is to fast and to pray. And I said, O Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. And then he goes on to first pray a prayer of, prayer of repentance. He confesses the sin of himself and the sin of the people of Judah and of Israel. And he declares how they've not been faithful to the Lord and how they were exiled because of it. And he prays this prayer of repentance. And then he prays asking God to intervene on behalf of the people and on behalf of these circumstances. Now, one of the things I want us to see from the book of Nehemiah is that prayer, our first response should always be prayer. Our first response should always be be prayer. We see this right here. Nehemiah, he's weeping, he's mourning at the news that he hears. And what does he let that weeping and mourning do? To motivate him to give himself to fasting and to prayer. This is his first response. And what we're going to see in a minute in chapter two, as he has an opportunity before the king in that moment that he has an opportunity to petition the king for something, he even stops to pray then. This is something that we know, right? This is something that Christians and church people know. We should be people of prayer, that we should have prayer be our first response in anything and everything. Yet so often, it is our last resort. We treat it like the 911 call, that something terrible has happened. Okay, well, now I'll pray. Or when we've got to the limits of our own ability, our own own intellect, our own skill, our own power, that's when we will finally pray. And I'm so reminded in this of Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, where it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not into your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. That all your ways part is the part that we struggle with. I'm thinking of 1 Thessalonians, where Paul was writing to the church in Thessalonica, and he told them, pray without ceasing. What does this look like, the praying in all your ways acknowledging God or the praying without ceasing? Does that mean that when we're at Culver's or at the grocery store or at our workplace, we're just sitting there, Lord God, I thank thee for this day. Thou helpest me unto mine endeavors that I might glorify thee. No, that's not what it means where we're like freaking everybody out and weirding everybody out by just perpetually nonstop talking. 
what it does mean, and the thing, the reason that I think that we don't pray as much as we ought is we have this false picture of prayer where it has to be this thing that's long drawn out, formal and professional, where we think if we don't have enough time, we shouldn't pray. And one of the things I love that we're about to see in chapter 2, when Nehemiah is before the king, where the king asks him, hey, Nehemiah, why the long face? It's a paraphrase there. But he's like, what's going on? Why are you so sad? Nehemiah, in that moment, prays. It says he prays. The king talks to him. So do you think Nehemiah was like, hold on, king. I'm going to go to my prayer closet for a minute. And then goes and kneels down and takes some time and comes back to the, no, you don't do that to the king. And so we see in a moment, it can be as quick and as simple as going, Lord, help me. And I'm assuming it was something like that. To pray without ceasing, to acknowledge the Lord in all our ways means in our meetings at work, before we start the meeting, if you work in an organization that welcomes it, you should pray. If you work in an organization that doesn't welcome it, in, in a, right there with yourself, just say, Lord, help me. Lord, give me wisdom. Lord, let me uh, be a diligent worker. Just in, in, in that moment or leading up to it, praying without ceasing and, and, and consulting the Lord in all your ways looks like first thing, the alarm goes off in the morning instead of going, going, Lord, thank you for another day. Lord, give me your heart today. Fill me with your spirit. Lord, guide me. Lord, give me a hunger for you. Lord, Lord, motivate me. Guard my heart. Lord, let me be faithful to you today. Let me live for your glory today. The first thing we do in the morning when we wake up should be to acknowledge the Lord. While we're preparing our breakfast, why not acknowledge the Lord? While we're commuting to and from work, why not acknowledge the Lord? When we're in the shower, what else are you doing but scrubbing your hair? Why not acknowledge the Lord? When our kids are having bad attitudes, God, help me. When we have bad attitudes, God, help me. When we have struggles or challenges or opposition, why not take a moment to ask the Lord for help? When things are going well, why not take a moment to say, Lord, thank you. When all, all circumstances, all times, all moments, we have audience with the God who is currently upholding and sustaining and maneuvering the universe. Let's stop and think about that for a moment because that's one of the things that we're like, yeah, I know, duh. No, stop for a minute. Hebrews tells us that, that Christ is currently up upholding all things by the word of his power. The universe, our solar system, this world, the environment, everything exists by the power of God at this very moment. Your lungs are converting car or, uh, oxygen to carbon dioxide and giving oxygen to your bloodstream right now because God's making your body do that. He designed your body to do that. You are understanding, interpreting the words I'm speaking right now because God gave you a mind to do that, the ability to do that. Your heart is pumping blood through your body right now because God is sustaining your being right now. We have that God at our access. We have audience with that God, we have the ear, the willing and delighting ear of that God. And we just say, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul should keep. Or we just say a cute little prayer before a meal. Why don't we pray as much as we ought to with the truth that we have audience with that God 24-7? Because sometimes we let our hearts get hardened. Sometimes we forget we have access to him. Sometimes we stray and wander. Sometimes we think it's too much or inconvenient or people might think I'm weird. All of those are bad reasons, right? And I'm not sitting here going, come on, guys, you suck at this. Get better. I suck at this and need to get better. I forget. I need to pray more than I do. And not only, the, the part, of the uh, part of the obstacle is the, the you need to idea. No, you get to, right? We get to. And if we can get our head around that, we're going to be a lot more like what we see in Nehemiah, where our response to everything is, Lord, 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 oh God, we would turn 
to him. If we truly believe that he is who scripture says he is and that he wants to hear our prayers, delights in hearing our prayers and wants to answer within his will, we'd be praying more. So we need to challenge our unbelief, repent of it, and continue to acknowledge the Lord in all our ways. Notice this, Nehemiah is praying and fasting, and we go to chapter 2 where it says in verse 1, in the month of Nisan. If you haven't done any research and didn't know, I want to put the magnifying glass on something here for you, or on something for you here. There we go. This is four months after he got the news. Four months after he'd been crying and weeping, this is four months of praying and fasting that Nehemiah prayed to the Lord. If we don't know that, we think, oh, Nehemiah prayed, and look, God just answered right away. This is four months later. And sometimes we don't pray as much as we ought to because we think it's, God's not going to do it or God's going to take too long. Listen, his thoughts and ways are higher. He's infinitely wise. He knows what we don't know. And let me remind you this morning, he loves you more than you love yourself. He cares about you and that person that's on your heart, your family member, your friend, your coworker that is, in, that is sick or that has some suffering or challenge. He loves them and cares about them more than you do. So that care that's in you motivating you to pray for someone else is this big compared to how much God loves them and cares about them. And so... When we pray before God, we recognize that we are trusting him with what we're asking for. Again, I, I, if you ever tell me that, that you're sick or injured or you're struggling with something, my prayer is always going to be, I'm going to ask God to heal you. And then I'm just going to trust him with the outcome. I'm going to ask God to fix whatever thing you're going through. I'm going to ask him and then trust in what First John said, that, that God answers when we pray according to his will. And if I pray something contrary to God's will, I know he's not going to answer it. And so I'm just going to ask anyway, because in Matthew, Jesus said, you have not because you ask not. So let's be a people who ask. Let's be a people who ask God for big things. Let's ask God for miracles. Let's ask God to heal. Let's ask God to move. Let's ask him to do incredible things so we can give glory to his name. But let's not be the people who go, oh, this is too small for God. Let's not be the people who go, I'm too busy. Let's not be the people who go, oh, they might think I'm weird. Let's take all those excuses, ball them up, and throw them in the wastebasket because they are garbage. We have the God of the universe who loves us with an everlasting love, who wants to hear from us wants us to depend on him, wants us to trust in him, and delights to answer and show us how good and how faithful he is. Chapter 2, verse 1, God answers Nehemiah's prayer four months later. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, remember he's the wine bearer, the cup bearer, I took up the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had not been sad in his presence. And the king said to me, why is your face sad, seeing you are not sick? So one more thing that was important about the serving in the king's court, you had to put on your game face. You were not allowed to go before the king of Persia, Mopi. You couldn't come in there all Eeyore like, oh, oh, it's me. The clouds are out. You couldn't do that. They would lift your head from your shoulders. You wouldn't be allowed to serve in that role if you didn't put on your smile, get in form, and go in to serve the king happily. They had to protect him from sadness. I'm not making this up or exaggerating. This is an ancient Persian culture. You are not allowed to be sad in the king's presence. And one day, Nehemiah is in the king's presence. I don't know if it's because he couldn't bear it anymore. I don't know if it's just God set it up this way, this day, this time. For some reason, Nehemiah went into the king's presence with a countenance that was distraught. And the king says, why are you sad? You're not sick. Let's continue looking at this. Verse two, and the king said to me, why is your face sad seeing you are not sick? This is nothing but sadness of the heart. Then I was very much afraid. Again, he could have been killed for this, for going into the king's presence, sadly. I said to the king, let the king live forever. Why should not my face be sad when the city, the palace, or the, the place of my father's graves lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? 
Then the king said to me, what are you requesting? And what does Nehemiah do? So I prayed to the God of heaven. I'm assuming again, we, scripture doesn't say this, but I think it's probably safe to assume that this prayer to God in heaven, as the king says, what are you asking me, bud? Is something like, God help me. I think that's probably about all he had opportunity to do. But with sincerity in his heart, God heard that prayer. And let's see what happens. And I said to the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, that you send me to Judah, the city of my father's graves, that I may rebuild it. And the king said to me, the queen sitting beside him, how long will you be gone? And when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me when I had given him a time. And I said to the king, if it pleases the king, <laughs> we're not just going to stop there. If it pleases the king, let letters be given to me to the governors of the province beyond the river that they may let me pass through until I come to Judah. Basically saying, send me with authority and protection. And a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the forest of the temple and for the wall of the city and for the house that I shall occupy. The scope of what Nehemiah was asking here is just increasing in the moment. It's not just, I'm sad because my home is destroyed. It's, I'm sad because my home is destroyed. And if it would please the king, let me go back. And if it would please the king, please write an authorized document showing people that you've sent with me and send me protection. And if it pleases the king, send me to the king's forest to get beams so that we can build this wall back up. He's asking the king not only to let him go, but to send him and to give him resources to do it. That's boldness. It seems like the, God help me, was working. And finally, at the end of verse 8, and the king granted me what I asked, for the good hand of my God was upon me. Now, I'm careful to draw some formula and say, if you pray and fast for four months, God will answer whatever you ask of your leaders in your life. We can't draw formulas from Scripture like that. But what we can do is actually take observe, observation and note that the favor of God was on Nehemiah in this situation, following him praying for four months and fasting for four months. Now, I'm not saying fasting as if I know the habits that he took there. But what we do know is that he was praying and this was a burden on his heart. And when finally God had given the opportunity before the king, where the king says, what's up? What are you asking? Let me go. God worked on Artaxerxes' heart to permit this. And I'm reminded right now of Proverbs 21 and verse 1, where it says, The heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord, and like rivers of water, he turns it wherever he desires. We see that verse, Proverbs 21, 1, happening here. That, that Nehemiah, who had been praying to the Lord, standing before the king, says, King, can I do these things and can you fund it? From your kingdom, can you fund our initiative over here? And the heart of King Artaxerxes is in the hand of the Lord to where Artaxerxes looks favorably at this request that could have been offensive, could have got shot down, could have got Nehemiah killed. And Artaxerxes says, yeah, yeah, you can go do that. And yeah, I'll sign the paper. And yeah, go take some of my timber. God answered his request. God gave him favor. God made way for God's purposes upon the back of Nehemiah's prayers and fasting. Why was the good hand of God upon him? I'm pretty sure it was because he'd been fasting and praying for four months. And even in that moment, prayed quickly or internally. And the God who holds the heart of kings in his hands put the good hand of God upon Nehemiah and gave him favor with Artaxerxes. So, Nehemiah is sent back to Jerusalem with the king's protection, the king's resources, and the king's authority. And before he starts telling everyone in Jerusalem what he's there for, he doesn't come back going, hey guys, I'm here, and guess what? I've got a paper and some timber, and we're going to rebuild the walls. Now he gets there patient with wisdom, and he goes and surveys the land, and he goes all around the wall and checks it out, looks at the destruction. He gives himself a picture of what's got to be done. 
And once he's done this, he gathers all the leaders of Jerusalem together. And then he makes this pitch to them. Let's go to chapter 2. And we'll start in verse 17. He says, Then I said to them, You see the trouble we are in? How Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burned? Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer suffer derision. And I told them of the hand of my God that had been upon me for good and also of the words that the king had spoken to me. And they said, let us rise up and build. Check this out. So they strengthened their hands for the good work. Nehemiah, what does he do here to these leaders? He tells them, he, makes, he presents the problem to them. And then beyond that, he tells them, guys, the good hand of God has been upon me. Check this out. King Artaxerxes sent me and he answered my requests and he gave me this paper and he's given us timber. Look at what God's doing. Look at what God has done. Let's build. They hear what God has been doing, see what God is doing and blessing and leading Nehemiah to do, and they're stirred with faith and encouragement and excitement and passion, and they go, yeah, let's build. And then it says they strengthened their hands for the work. So they went in their closets and got out those little springy things and started doing this. And no, this is a metaphor, meaning they strengthened their resolve for the work of God that was before them. When it says they strengthen their hands for the work, this, this translates to us today that we continually come and hear from the word of God what God has already done. We hear that God has made all things good and that sin corrupted things, but God redeemed things through Jesus Christ. We hear the history of salvation in scripture. We get excited and impassioned by that. And likewise, we similarly have a call and a mission from God not to build a wall, but to go out the great commission to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded, Jesus saying this, and behold, I'm with you until the end of the age. We have a mission from God for us today that's not putting stones upon each other, but it is building up individuals in Christ, that it is telling people of the truth of Jesus Christ, that it is evangelizing, it is discipling, it is strengthening people in faith in God. And hopefully, likewise, we hear this, we remember what God has done, and we also say, yeah, let's build the church. And I'm not talking about making our building bigger. I'm talking about building lives upon the word of God, that we say, yeah, let's strengthen our hands. Let's commit ourselves to this mission of God. Amen? Amen. I don't want to be the church that just has church. I don't want us to be the church that just comes together every Sunday and has the feels from how awesome Gino and Andrea sound and the rest of their team and has a, a sermon that just makes us feel whatever. That No, that we would be equipped in the church to go use our lives to make an impact for the kingdom of God. Why are we here? We have to ask ourselves, what kind of church do we want to be? Do we want to be a church that just plays games and goes, all right, we got our little religious check mark? Or do we want to be the church that strengthens our hands to give ourselves to the work of God? I hope, amen. I hope that's it, amen. Amen means so be it. I welcome you to say it when we say things like that. Do we want to be the church that gives ourselves to the work of God? Amen. That's what I hope and pray for. That's what I hope you pray for. That we would strengthen our hands for the good work. Now, chapter 3 is essentially the chapter that has the list of all these names. Again, expecting parents, just go survey and find a good name for yourself for that newborn baby and teach us how to say it. <laughs> but... It goes through the survey of the list of all these names saying this person worked next to this person and this person built this section next to this person next to this person. It says this 13 times the phrase next to them or next to him. And then beyond that 16 times it says and after them this person. 
13 next to and 16 after, this picture of this person built here and then next to them, this person, and after them, this person came, and then next to them, this person built, and next to them, this person, and next to them, this person, and after them, this person, and after them, this person, and after them, this person. What we see here is the work of God is not done by one person. Nehemiah didn't come in there and build it all himself. He told people what God was doing, what God has done, and the people said, let's do it. And they all found their place and did their part. I also want to point out something else. These were not all contractors. These were not all wall builders. I don't know the terminology back then. These were not people who were all skilled and experienced with building stone structures. In fact, if you go through the list, you will notice that there were all sorts of people mentioned like priests, like perfumers. When you're picturing people taking big stones and building a nine foot deep stone wall, did you have perfumers in your mind? No. You think, (laughs) goldsmiths, merchants, rulers, women. This would not have been expected. What do we see from this? Anyone and everyone has a part to play. I'm reminded of 1 Corinthians chapter 12 where the Apostle Paul is talking to the church in Corinth and he says the body of Christ has many parts. Jesus Christ being the head of the body and all of us are parts or members of it. And what we tend to do, again, is go, oh, how much ministry can I really do? I'm not good at speaking like Stephen. Or I can't sing like Gino and Andrea, so I'm less important because I just serve over here in this behind-the-scenes thing. Or I just have these kind of skills. I'm not an orator. I'm not good at this or that. God wired, gift, and designed every single one of you with certain things for his purposes. He made you good at things that I am terrible at. There are some things that I should never touch. And there are some things you should never touch. And I want to encourage you not to look at what other people are good at and get jealous and go, I wish I was. I wish I could. When you do that, you get on American Idol looking like an idiot because your family never told you that you actually can't sing. (laughs) Truth is hard sometimes. But ask yourself, what has God made me good at? And how can I use that for his purposes? Scripture makes it abundantly clear that he has given all of us gifts. There is not a person hearing me that has not been gifted by God to do something for him in this life. This life that is a vapor. You know, the older you get, the more you see that it's like going fast. I'm only 37 and I'm like, how is it already? Summer is almost over. I probably should start Christmas shopping now. Like my daughter's already five, about one of them's about to turn four, and it's like they were just born. Like it goes fast. Scripture teaches us this, and we live in a society and a culture and a world that's telling you, hey, this and this and this and this are the things that are worthy of your time. These are the things worthy of your money. These are the things worthy of your devotion. These are the things worthy of your schedule. And I, as your pastor, feel part of my responsibility is to stand up here and unapologetically say no. The kingdom of God and his purposes and his mission is worthy of your time, is worthy of your life, is worthy of your devotion, is worthy of your effort, worthy of your energy, worthy of your schedule, worthy of your inconvenience, worthy of your uncomfortability because you get a front row seat of seeing God save sinners. Why are we here? What are we doing? What kind of church do we want to be? We're going to stand before the Lord one day. And I don't know about you, and I hope I know about you, but don't we want to be the people that stand before the master and give an account for our lives and hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. And what we do is we look at everyone else in our culture, in our society, in our world, and we look at them and go, okay, living this way is okay because see, Instead of going, how should I live? What should I do? 
What should I say no to when I'm making my schedule? What in my life should I cut out because God put me here for such a time as this and God forbid I waste my life on myself, my pleasure, my comfort, my convenience. God forbid that be said of us. Let it be said of us that we're a people who abandon our lives to accomplish God's purposes with why he put us here. Amen? Amen. What are we doing? Why are we here? Who do we want to be? I want us to be the church that is giving our lives sacrificially. And it takes the word of God to wake us up to all the things that we are prone and trained to give ourselves to because we still go to church and we try and do good things and we pray at night and we use all these things to justify a passive American dream living where we give little tips of the cap to God here and there instead of completely abandoning our flesh and selfish desires unto the plans and purposes of God. You live in the country where it's most dangerous spiritually. The country that's trying to culture you and train you to live for the here and now instead of casting your eyes again to the horizon of eternity where we stand before the Lord of creation. Vapor. Eternity. We will stand before the Lord. And I'm hoping we can stand before him going, I did the best I could with what you gave me. I couldn't preach like Stephen. I couldn't sing like Gino. But I could do this, Lord, and I used it for you. You have a part to play. You could be a perfumer building the wall. You could be a priest. You could be a goldsmith. You could be whatever you are, wherever you are. Just ask yourself, God, what do you want me to do with it? And at the end of the day, we lay our head on our pillow going, did I live for God today or myself? Did I contribute to his work today or my own ambitions? Because when you get to the end of the, your life, you're not going to sit there. I've, done, I've been at funerals more than you have. My role makes that happen. I've been to a lot of funerals, you too, Doug. And those people are never saying, I wish I would have bought more stuff, right? No. On the deathbed, people are saying much more meaningful, significant things. And oftentimes, the regret is that they wish they would have done more for the Lord. Let's wake up now. Man, I have rambled a lot more there than I wanted to, but I just have to trust that the Holy Spirit was in that. Okay, we all have our own part to play in God's mission. Of course, as Spencer talked about last week, there were enemies who didn't want to see Jerusalem built. And in chapter 4, we would see that same guy that he talked about, Sanballat, who hears that the wall is being built. He gets angry, gets his friends together. He's a Samaritan. They get the, uh, the, the Ashdodians and the Ammonites and the Arabians together, these surrounding territorial enemies of Jerusalem. And they start mocking Israel. They start mocking the wall, saying, they're trying to rebuild this wall. <laughs> if a fox even tries to climb on that wall, it's going to fall. They're just making fun of them. And listen, if you're going to be given to the work of God, there will, be people, there will be people who mock you and make fun of you. And hopefully we can respond the way that we see Nehemiah and the people of Israel respond. That they prayed, and then they got back to work. And when people mock you for being a Christian, mock you for living for the Lord and his purposes, can we just go, uh, just pray for him, pray for yourself, and get back to work. Live for the mission of God. When they had opposition, they prayed, and they gave themselves back to the mission. And I'm having to, for the sake of the kids' workers who are watching your fun toddlers, going to keep on moving and we see in Nehemiah chapter 4 and verse 15, their prayers when these guys were conspiring against them and mocking them. Chapter 4, verse 15, we see some of their prayers answered. When our enemies heard that it was known to us and that God had frustrated their plan, God answered their prayers and frustrated their plan, we all turned to the wall and each to his work. They just went, ah, let's get back to work. 
Chapter 5, Nehemiah learns that there are these elite snob Jews who are taking advantage of poorer, lesser Jews, so to speak. I'll say lesser. And the, uh, everyone at this point, remember, was still in slavery to Persia. And Nehemiah was using his own wealth, his own position, his own influence to buy Jews back out of that slavery and liberate them into the promised land. But there were other Jews there who were doing the opposite, that were using their wealth, their status, and their position to oppress people, to use the bondage of the famine that was happening in the land to have people keep on selling them more of their money, more of their land, even their own families to where they became enslaved to these elites. And then these elites... um, terribly sold them to other countries. Nehemiah learns about this. He gets ticked and he tells them off. He says, how dare you do this to your brothers? This is not okay. And they're sitting there going, oh, uh, uh. they had nothing to say. Confronts them, they fix it, and they move on. The point I'll say here is that you can use your resources and your influence to help others or to help yourself. And if you're living to help yourself, you'll take advantage of other people. You're going to oppress other people, but if you're living to serve God's mission, you're going to be living to set people free. Okay? I wanted to say more there, but yeah. And then finally, in in chapter 7, when the work is completed, I want to point out one and a half miles of wall, stone wall, nine feet thick, a mile and a half, nine feet thick, 52 days, they built it. Your wow is what the enemies and surrounding people did. It says that they heard that the wall had been built a mile and a half, nine feet thick in 52 days, and their enemies step back and go, God must really be helping them. My hope and prayer, too, for our church is that we would be so given to the mission and the work of God that we'd be such a people of prayer, such a people of the word, that God would be so in the midst of what we're doing, driving what we're doing, accomplishing, blessing, orchestrating, leading, guiding, protecting, empowering us, that everyone else would sit there and go, God must really be helping them at Word of Grace. That stuff that they're doing, did you hear what they just did? God had to be in on that. Like, I hope our church would be full of only God could do that moments. What if we started asking God to do things? And I'm just going to tell you guys this. We had a board meeting this last week, and I was so encouraged and fired up. Wonderful board meeting. And I'm just going to tell you, there's some things coming in our future that I'm really excited about that I wish I could tell you about right now. I can't wait to tell you about. But we're praying and we're discerning on what God is doing And there's some stuff that I believe the Lord is leading us into that we're doing our due diligence on. But when I announce it to you, I can't wait. And my hope is that the same way that we're going to strengthen our hands for the work. And there is an impact that God wants us to make in our community. And I'm hoping that our church family, I'm praying and I'm confident that our church family, like these Judeans, are going to go, yeah, let's strengthen our hands for the work of the Lord and let's give ourselves to that. Because there's other things in our life that we could give our time to, but let's give our lives to the eternal work of the Lord. When the work is completed in chapter 7, orders are given and duties are assigned, Nehemiah decides to create a register of all the families present, and he looks back at the old registry from the first wave of people that came in. And then he updates the registry of all the people who were there helping work on the wall. And then we get to chapter 8, where we see revival begin. Revival is a term that I, I want to talk about for a moment, because sometimes I see it um, thrown around without explanation and, and, and thrown out as the goal. And, and I want to say there's a difference. I think some people err into what's called revivalism, which is where revival or what is understood as revival becomes the goal rather than the byproduct or the fruit of the goal. And what I mean here is you see throughout the book of Nehemiah, you see prayer, prayer, 
prayer, prayer. In chapter 9, you see the people of God come together, and Ezra, remember him, the scribe and the priest? He begins reading the word of God to them. He begins reading the law. He reads Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy to the assembly of all the people. They sat there half a day listening to him read Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. So we could keep going today. I'm just kidding. But half of their day was given to that. And then after he teaches them or or reads the law to them, for the next few hours, the Levites get out among the people and begin explaining what was just read to them, giving the people understanding. And when this happens, God begins to move in the people. He revives them. He awakens them. He He returns them to faithfulness to him. He returns their hearts to the Lord. See, the Holy Spirit of God works with the Word of God to revive the people of God. I'll say this one more time. The Holy Spirit of God works with the Word of God to revive the people of God. That's why it's so important to get in the Word of God. Because when you get into the Word for yourself, the Holy Spirit comes in and illuminates what you're reading. He he convicts, He empowers, He transforms, He changes. The Word of God blesses His Word and works through the Word by His Holy Spirit to bring us into transformation. He works in other ways, but I'm telling you the dominant way He works is through His Word. Revival is that awakening, that renewing, that passion, that fire for God internally in an individual and in a body that happens. Revivalism, revivalism, which I want to guard and caution against, is when you make revival the message rather than the fruit of the message. You make revival the goal rather than the results of the goal, which is knowing the reviver. And when you do this, you put the cart before the horse and you try and fabricate and manufacture by your own abilities, your own research, your own studying. If we do X, Y, Z, then we're going to make a move of God. And you can look throughout history, the Great Awakening, different revivals that have happened throughout history. You know how they happened? They happened by a people praying and by a people returning to the word of God. And when that happens, the Holy Spirit works to open people's eyes, to convict them of their sin, to bring them to repentance, where he begins to work in their lives and then use them for his purposes. That's what revival is. It's not just some experience that happens in a church. It's when people are awakened by the Holy Spirit of God. And it happens after prayer and from the word of God. Returning wasn't enough. Rebuilding wasn't enough. The people still needed reviving. If their hearts weren't reoriented back to God, all of this would have been in vain because they still would have returned back to their old ways, their old sins. So what do they do? They not only have returned to the city of Jerusalem, they returned to the word of God. They not only had to rebuild the temple and the city walls, they had to rebuild their understanding and their faithfulness to God and his word. At the entry of God's word, we see godly sorrow over sin. In chapter 9, the longest prayer in all of scripture, we see a prayer of repentance and brokenness and contrition. And we also see rejoicing over the work that God is doing. And time's running fast, so let's just really quick chapter 9. I'm going to skip some of this, but we see in the prayer of Ezra in chapter 9, him reciting back to God all the ways that God had been faithful by calling Abraham out of the Ur of Chaldeans, which is the same area in which they were oppressed in Babylon and Persia. Calling Abraham out of there and calling him into his family. He recites back to God in his prayer that God delivered the people out of Egypt, making a name for himself. He recites back all the faithfulness of God generation after generation and how the people turned from God. And then I want to point out verse 17. It says, they refused to obey and were not mindful of the wonders that you performed among them, but they stiffened their neck and appointed a leader to return to their slavery in Egypt. Here we go. But you are a God ready to forgive. Gracious and merciful. Slow to anger 
and abounding in steadfast love, and you did not forsake them. I want to say to you this morning, wherever you are in your life, God is always ready to forgive. Don't believe the lie that you have gone too far, you have done too much, that you're too bad. Every single one of us are jacked up and need the grace of God. And God is always ready to forgive. But Stephen, I've done the same thing 20 times. Yeah, that's the same Jesus who said to his disciples, how many times should we forgive someone when they offend us? Seven times seven? Jesus said 70 times seven. Not saying do the math, but every time keep forgiving. Keep forgiving. Forgiveness is in the heart of God for you. He is always ready to forgive you. And finally, the book of Nehemiah wraps up with the city built, but empty. Because all of the people at this time were in living in the towns around the city because it was disheveled. And now that they've rebuilt it, the people moved by the Spirit of God start tithing people, meaning they give a tenth of their people from these outer towns to commit to move their lives back into the city. This is awesome. You know why? Because this is what it looks like when our lives are so passionately committed to the work of God and the mission of God before us that we literally let it steer our life decisions. What if, instead of just saying, should I keep this job or get another job because of pay and benefits and schedule and pros and cons, what if instead we went, should I keep this job or get another job because I'd be able to be more effective for the kingdom of God this way? What if instead of saying, should we have this house or buy a different house because we like this one better or this style or that location better? What if instead we said, God, which house could we be more effective for your kingdom with? What if instead of going, hey, what do we want to do with our summer blah, 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 because we enjoy this or enjoy that? What if instead we said, God, how can we be most effective for you with our summer? What if instead of going, retirement, yay, I get to kick up my feet and collect seashells and get to go golfing and all those things which are fine, are good things when done unto the glory of God within moderation. What if we used our retirement to say, God, I got time now. What do you want me to do with it? Take your vacations, take your trips, play golf, but let the brunt be living for the purposes of God. Amen? Amen. If we want to do something more than just have church, if we want to be a part of God's work today in this church, in this community, in our state and nation and world, it will be because we have become a people of prayer and a people of the word of God. And if we can be a people who are given to prayer and given to the word of God, I am confident that God is going to do things in and through our church family that will make people around us go, whoa, look at what God's doing there. And they'll also say, I think I want a piece of that. And God will get the glory. And we will stand before him with tearful joys in our eyes, or tears of joy in our eyes, longing at the face of our Savior, to hear those words hanging on every word of, well done, my good and faithful servant. We're faithful today in those moments, in those decisions, when we ever live mindful of that day, living in light of eternity, doing the work of God, unto the glory of God. Do you want to be a part? Do you want to be a part? Amen. Let's strengthen our hands for the work. Let's pray. Let's give ourselves to the word. And let's do it. God, we thank you for this day. Thank you for your word. God, I pray by your Holy Spirit that you have awakened us. 
I ask you to awaken us, to challenge us, to call us, to revive us for your purposes, God. Anyone who here is stagnant in their faith, I ask that you would stir them up right now. I ask that you would give them a vision for their life given to your purposes rather than to our own ambitions. If there's anyone here that doesn't know you, I ask by your Holy Spirit that you would open their eyes right now to see and believe in you. I ask that you would bring them to genuine repentance and faith. You would fill them with your Holy Spirit and transform them, transform them and use them for your purposes. And God, for those of us who do know you, I ask that you would continue to revive us, stir us up, stir our affections for you, stir our commitment to you, and help us discern in our lives what we are to give our time to, our money to, our passion to, our skills to. God, let us live every day for your purposes and your glory that we could ever be mindful of the day that we will stand before you, helping us be faithful today where we live to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. God, let that be us. In Jesus' name. And everyone said amen.